That's a good thing because we are the body of Christ. And it's so good that we conversate with one another and tell one another how much we love one another and how much we need one another. That's just so vital. Don't ever withhold your love from somebody. Don't ever withhold your prayer from somebody. Give it all out because people need what's inside of you. And we need each other. So vital. You know, last week, Pastor Monique, thank you, my brother. Just stay here with me, though, because you do sound way more anointed when you're playing. But you could stop for a few moments. But last week, Pastor Monique, she did such an excellent job, and, and she spoke to us and said that we, as a body, we're in a season of healing. And she spoke about the weapon of unity. And I almost wanted to uh, entitle this The Healing Remedy Part 2. But I didn't um, because what I loved about her sermon was that it involved us. That unity is not going to happen without us. We're the participators. And I want to layer tonight with another weapon to heal us as the body of Christ. And the writer in Hebrews, he addresses this very common and chronic issue in the body of Christ. It's a plague. It's been a plague from the beginning when God called his people. But I also love that not only does the book address the problem, it addresses the solution. And I want you to know something. For every problem in the word of God, there's a solution. God is, is solution-oriented, and we as people need to stop looking at the problem and ask God for the solution. We need to be solution-oriented people. So let me address the problem first. In Hebrews 3, 7 and 8, it says, So, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did, but really the writer is saying as your forefathers did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert. And then he goes on in verse 12, he says, see to it, brothers, sisters, that none of us, none of you, none of me has an unbelieving, sinful heart that turns away from the living God. So the writer here is stating that there's clear and present danger, a real possibility that any of us on any given day at any given time can be attacked with this deadly disease called an unbelieving heart. It may not sound like a big deal, but an unbelieving heart is a terrible thing because eventually your heart gets hard and you end up dying spiritually. It happens like it happened to God's people in the desert. They ran into obstacles. And then when God was speaking to them, they couldn't hear the Lord because their heart was already unbelieving. And it happens to us when we go through tests and we go through trials, whether they be easy trials or severe trials, our hearts start to become unbelieving hearts, and we stop not believing in the promises of God, and we start um, uh, not, not trusting in the Lord. And he's saying, you know, our hearts will stop beating after the Lord eventually when our heart is unbelieving. So the writer is stating that we're all prone to this malady. We're all prone to this. And an unbelieving heart is what kept God's people out of the promised land. And an unbelieving heart will keep us from, from getting to our destiny because we end up like they did, walking in circles with doubt and fear that replaces trust and faith. So in the very next verse, he gives us the solution, and this is what I love. So the writer is saying that this calamity 
somebody in the body of Christ that has an unbelieving heart, somebody in the body of Christ that is right on the cusp of having a hardened heart. He's saying, listen, this calamity could be avoided and averted. This negative could be canceled out and turned into a positive by someone stepping up in the body of Christ and obeying God's voice. Somebody stepping up and picking up the weapon that I'm going to speak about. And the writer is placing us in a position where you and I are responsible for one another because we are our brother's keeper. Verse 13, he says, but this is the solution. Encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. In other words, encouragement goes a long way. Notice it says encourage one another daily. It doesn't say discourage one another daily. I don't know about you, but I grew up uh, in the Lord for many, many years. And decades ago, the body of Christ thought that the Bible said we're to discourage one another daily. We were always told what was wrong with us and what we couldn't be and what we aren't instead of being told what we could be and how God sees us. So I want you to notice two things. In verse 7, I already wrote, read it. It says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today. And then in verse 13, he says, encourage one another daily as long as it is called today. So today is the key word. What we do today matters. How we step up today matters. The way we pick up the weapon of encouragement matters. Our words matter. Our tone matters. Our obedience matters. And this is the antidote to prevent this spiritual calamity. All it is is a daily dose of spiritual encouragement. I mean, how simple is that? It doesn't say if somebody is on the cusp of an unbelieving heart, hardening of the spiritual arteries, have a deliverance service. He doesn't say speak in tongues and wait for the interpretation. It doesn't say wait till you get to the prayer meeting. Hopefully that person will come and then you can go lay hands on them. He says no. He says encourage one another. Because encouragement is massive. Be sin or discouragement hardens, but encouragement softens. Romans 12, 8 says that encouragement is a gift of the Spirit. But I believe every single one of us have this gift. But I also think that we think of it as a lesser gift. It's not like prophecy or teaching. It's more like milk. It's not meat. But I'm here to tell you that this weapon is disguised like Clark Kent, but it's really Superman. It is the superman of all the gifts. Now, the word encouragement comes from the Greek word parakaleo. And the word para means to come alongside. And the word kaleo means to inspire with hope, to strengthen, to stimulate, to comfort, to urge, to breathe courage into. So the picture of encouragement in action is one who comes alongside of another for supporting, for strengthening, for comforting, so that they don't lose their courage. It's more than a nice thing. It's a God thing. Because the root word of parakaleo is the word paraklesis. And that's another name for the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside of us to inspire, support, strengthen, comfort, urge to breathe life into so that you and I don't lose our courage. And this weapon of encouragement, it's a weapon of mass destruction. It stops the lies of the enemy from the mental assault 
that tells our brothers or sisters that they don't belong, that they are not needed, that they are not appreciated, that they are not special, that it's too hard, that they're not going to make it. And everyone needs encouragement. Even the Apostle Paul needed encouragement. Acts 21 through 28, that's seven chapters, and that's a span of Paul's life for three years. That's a span of three years. And in that span, if you read it, we see that Paul was attacked by an angry mob. He was misunderstood. He was slandered. He was chased. He was chained. He was shipwrecked. He was bit by a snake. And he finally gets back to Rome, and he knows he's going to die. So I would imagine that the Apostle Paul needed some encouragement. You know, leaders need encouragement, guys. We need people to encourage us as we need to encourage you because we're all in this together. And I love this scripture. You can easily overlook it. But in Acts 28, 15, it says the brothers there had heard that we were coming. This is Paul coming to Rome. And they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these men, after all Paul went through, shipwrecked, beaten, chained, bit by a snake, assaulted, imprisoned, at the sight of these men, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. Now listen. The three taverns were 35 miles south of Rome. Those people walked 35 miles. The way of Appius is 43 miles. These believers walked 38 and 43 miles just to encourage the Apostle Paul. Not to preach at a conference. Not to do a book signing. Not to have their names written in the book because they're not written in the books. They came, they walked all that way to tell Paul, Paul, you're not alone. Paul, we see you. Paul, God loves you. Paul, keep on keeping on. I'm rooting for you. We're the people we've been praying for you. Can you help me, my brother? And here's the question tonight, how far will... Are you willing to, to go to encourage somebody? How far are you and I willing to go to encourage somebody? How far are we willing to step out of our comfort zone, stop what we're doing when we're quickened by the Holy Spirit? To let someone know you're not alone. God sees you. I love you, thinking about you, praying for you. I think too often times when God quickens us, our first response is, they don't need it. But if the Holy Spirit's quickening you, they need it. Or, well, why are they down? What did they do? to get in that situation. The Holy Spirit is telling you, just encourage them. You don't need to analyze their situation. Just show them kindness. We need to show one another kindness because we don't know what someone else is going through. We don't know what kind of day someone else has had. If we analyze, we're not going to pick up this weapon that I believe will cement our unity because there's something about personally co connecting with some. Yeah, but they hardly know me. It's okay. They know the Lord. And when the Holy Spirit quickens us, we, we have to be people that obey because you, your obedience may save somebody's life. Your obedience may save a heart from hardening. 
Listen, remember every time you've gotten a call, a text, a visit, somebody went and laid hands on you, you were encouraged. Those people that reach out to you, they're 43 mile friends. We want to be 43 mile friends. That's what we want to be in the body of Christ. We want to walk out of our way to make sure our brother or sister knows you're not alone. I love you. God sees you. You're going to make it. Oh, it's not too hard. You're going to make it. God's with you. He's for you. He's not against you. I thank God for my 43 mile friends because I would not be standing up right now if it wasn't for them. And I want us to be those 43 mile friends to one another so that we can heal together. Encourage one another daily. Daily means every day. As long as it is called today. So that nobody in this church, nobody in Saints Church, is going to fall away with an unbelieving hard heart because somebody neglected to reach out to them. Amen? Amen. We're going to take communion in a moment, um, but I just want to pray for us as a body. Lord, I thank you that you're healing us. I thank you for the love of God that I sense when we're in the room together. I pray, God, that you deepen our love for one another. I pray for everyone in this room that says, I have nothing to give. I pray, God, that they would know it doesn't take much to change a life. Lord, I am praying, oh God, for the people that will go out of their way, that you would continue to strengthen them because we know how the enemy would come and say, oh, you're not needed. No, God, we want to have that gift of encouragement. As a matter of fact, we want this place to excel in the gift of encouragement, that you might unify us, Lord, one mind, one accord. We're in one mind with you and in one accord with one another. Do something mighty, oh God. We pray, Lord, in our midst like never, ever before, in Jesus' precious name, amen and amen.